All right, so uh, let me talk about Quentin Tarantino for a bit, right? And yeah. in this case, we're going to talk about his seventh film, which was Django Unchained. So um, it, it should come as no surprise to, to you guys here. I am a huge, huge fan of Quentin Tarantino. Um, he is probably one of my favorite directors of all time. You know, he really influenced yeah. me the way. But the thing that, that re- I really loved about him, right? And is I didn't really get it. You know, for many people, they got it when they saw Pulp Fiction. But um, because, you know, I was too young when Pulp Fiction came out in 94. And, you know, quite notoriously, we never got that movie in Trinidad. We never got that movie here. Kid Taxi Parts, we never did, right? So, okay, I was a little that party there. So, um, my true, true, true introduction to, to Tarantino, um, and oh yes, well, this kind of excludes the the heavily edited uh, TV version of um, of Pulp Fiction, which I remember airing on um, on VH1. You know, just centering on the cussing and you know, just the racy yeah. moments now. So, my true introduction to Tarantino was in the form of one of my all time favorite movies, Kill Bill. Volume one. Yeah. That moment, like when the Shaw brothers intro when the music plays, I was <laughs> like, All right, this is what I want to do, Dre. This is what I want to do. Cause really what this sh- what that show did, and of course the sequel of what's which I love as well, is that he would take these genres, these really I'm not obscure genres, but just like genres that, you know, um the the, the I would say like the the bourgeois sort of you know turning news at film critic will kind of look down on like oh i don't really care for spaghetti westerns and you know kung fu films and exploitation films but tarantino just have a way of just taking these genres and not just making them badass and making them kind of original even though it's more pastiche than anything else but putting that kind of class in there you know what i mean like so even those kind of study those critics could look at it and be like yeah, feeling this, even though they weren't in the right mind sit down to watch the movies that they inspired by that, you know what I mean? So, right. totally loved Kill Bill Volume 1. And I always see this, and it's actually the truth, right? That was the moment where I was like, I want to study film. Like, I want to do that because right. I just want, like, I just love watching films. So, I just want, I just love the idea that there's a guy who is just as passionate about watching films and studying films that he can just take these things that he loved and put it in a way that people never saw it before and make a quote unquote original film, right? Even though it's more pastiche. You know what I mean? But then, you know, Kill Bill Volume 2 came out and then it's like, oh, well, it's not just about style. It's not just about blood and guts and whatnot. The man could tell a story. The man could tell a real powerful story, have great characters, really compelling characters, have a lot of emotion to it, you know, and of course, solid direction and great, great, great choice in music. In music. So that yeah. was the, well, so, so one and two basically was where I got the style and substance he just had a way of just blending those two well i i, I felt he dropped the ball with uh death proof uh this was the yeah, collab you know the double feature that he did with uh with fellow grindhouse worshiper uh robert rodriguez who's uh planetary film i i i actually enjoy the hell out of that show. I, I i need to get that on blu-ray though but i unfortunately i have death proof as part of this uh tarantino you know, double X uh, collection, which I have. So yeah, I actually rewatched that uh, a lo- a while ago, and yeah, that proof does not work at all. Um, yeah. But I saw where he was getting at, though. It, it just didn't work at all. It was just too much of his talkiness that did need to be in that show. And uh, yeah, yeah, no, okay. yeah, right. So eventually, I, you know, I checked out, uh, you know, Reservoir Dogs. Really enjoyed that. Pulp Fiction. Yeah. I really enjoyed it too, although it took it, it, it took about a while at first. Like in the first time I was like, you know, this this is just how real talking it. Like that's the point, is he talking? But then when I watched it again, you know, with more mature eyes, I was like, but he no, but the dialogue has a purpose. You know, the, the way how the characters move and everything that's in the show has a purpose. It all leads to something. And I really dug that. So, you know, many people will say Pulp Fiction is his best work. I still see it's his magnum opus, but to me, it's not my right. you know, number one, number one, number one favorite. But I do see why it is for, for many people. Uh, and then I, I saw Jackie Brother. That was the one that people was, you know, was you know, on the well by because like, well, no, well it's people, not, it doesn't have people, action and it doesn't have the, right. you know, the, the subversiveness in it. But to me, I just saw it as this, this, this love letter to Black Exploitation Cinema. You know, he got Pam right. Gray, got one of the best performances from her in it. And it was just a yeah. great story, you know, even though it is well, a, lot, a tad bit slow-paced and whatnot. 
Yeah, a lot of people consider that that is mature in film. Like yes, yes, yes. Because because it wasn't well received, you cannot you cannot slide back now. Yeah, it's the that. whole it's the whole you know exploitation cinema worship with uh, with right. Kill Builder. Right. Um, yeah. But to me, he got a balance with that with uh, 2009's and Glorious Bastards, right? Which was right. one of my favorite shows of uh, of, uh, of that film. Right, and you know, for many people, we'll see this is his best uh, film to date. It, it I have to think about that, though. Like, I really have yeah. to think about that. Because as much as I love Glorious Masters, though, it's not one hour this point one time I'll be like, yes, this is the best movie ever, in my opinion. Even though no, no, it, it is, it is my form book. as far as directing and especially storytelling goes. Uh, he right. got a masterful performance from Christoph Waltz, you know, exactly. from Bad Fit. That's why it's so yeah, and, and the main thing that, that I love about the Glorious Bastards is how it threw people off, though, because, like, I, I never forgot. Uh, going in for the first time, I was expecting this thing to be this full tilt war picture, but actually, it's not really. It's more of a tribute to cinema of the of the 40s. Uh, you right. know, is this how he kind of... It's like his own version of World War Two. It's not a war film in the sense that you see in tanks and bullets and guns and explosions. But it is about World War II. So that in itself just blew me away. Dude. Like a war film that wasn't really about war. You know? <laughs> but yeah, everything yeah. else about it was just flawless in my opinion. But still, I don't think I don't really think about whether that is the absolute best film you ever make. But uh, yeah, you were saying that's your, your all-time favorite film, right? It is, it is my favorite of his. Um, uh, well, well why, why, if you know why I'm asking. Uh, mostly because of just the, the really good set pieces, how everything set up against Christoph Waltz was a big standout for this for me. Um, the story built, I love the story of it. Um, it worked better than, than all of his other films. Uh, probably, you know, it, it's between this and, and maybe Kill Bill Volume 2, um, where it, you just like, you know, it's, it's the best, some of the best dialogue and monologue. And yes. then you know, have some great set pieces in this that work so well. Um, um, the, the, the intro scene just, for one is probably one of the greatest exactly sequences yeah, yeah, that, he's that ever totally made. Period. One. Period. Yeah. yeah, yeah, one of the best intro scenes. But he, but just they had some great moments in it that just build itself up so well. Like the second scene with with Daniel Bruhl in the in the restaurant, I love that. Oh and yeah, then, in the uh, when they play the card game, love that. Right. Um, especially yeah, yeah, yeah. the way how tension was built in that. That was just yeah, oh. yeah. It had some great moments. Yeah, the, the bar with the with the with the accent stuff, and he just ended. Like, where exactly are you from? And I love that. Little stuff like that, I just thought works so well better than most other Tarantino films in terms of just building tension and characters trying to scope each other out. I just thought so, so it was not only written excellently, um, but but just just blocked really, really good. Blocked yes. so, so good in that way now. Um, yeah, yeah I, I, I dug it for what it was. I, I, and it, it did that even better than, say, Hateful Eight, in my opinion. Like, how Hateful Eight did the whole tension stuff. No, that was right, much uh, better. Especially with like, uh, well, not a small amount of characters, but yeah, characters in a room, basically. He, he did that with Hateful Eight. Uh, yeah. But, but you know, uh, touching on, on Hateful Eight, right? Just to talk about that before we get to Jago and Shane, right? Uh, Hateful Eight is a show that uh, I, I enjoy. I appreciate for what it is. But yeah. uh, to me, at the time when I reviewed it, uh, I said that it was his darkest film because of just right. how just really grim it was. You know, he does these unforgiving characters, it's characters that you just hate. I just see them kind of try to get along, but, you know, eventually, you know, there's going to have some kind of, you know, some blood and somebody's going to get, somebody's going to get killed, right? Which is exactly what happens in, in Hateful Eight, right? Um, right. It's, but it's one of those shows that it, like the grimness of it, the darkness of it can kind of take you out of it a bit now because, you know, you kind of come to a Tarantino movie to enjoy yourself, to kind of laugh, to be emotionally moved. But, you know, just seeing all these really despicable characters is like, well, yeah. I don't know, you know what I mean? So um, it's not like his worst film or whatnot, but it's not one of his films that I will go back to in a hurry. Um, I, I um, actually need to get it on, Blu- on Blu-ray one day. I mean, maybe if I watch it again, I'll be like, yeah, this is actually great, you know what I mean? But it's, it's one that I know that if I just watch it a few more, just a couple more times, actually, I'd, I'd actually love it way more than I did back then. Even though I give it a, a solid four, but I have a feeling if I watch it, just a couple more times, it'll go like a little, you know, oof after. Yeah, no, um, Hateful It, I think Hateful It, for me personally, I wasn't into it as much because it just, I, I t- it just felt a bit too derivative. If, if you know, it, it's the typical Tarantino derivative stuff. And right. I didn't feel 
he brought enough of a spin to things for me to like it. Like compared to Kill Bill, Kill Bill felt all right. You, you know, it, it hit you with something at the end, and that yeah. felt even though it's still a typical martial arts revenge story. Um, I thought it wasn't as um, that was that was anywhere near as engaging as that, right? Um, so that's just my um, my take on that. I, I don't know. Hateful is something that didn't 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 land for me. We could only have really one moment that really worked, and that is when they found out the true nature of of Sam Jackson's character in relation with Abraham Lincoln. And I actually really liked that. Right. I thought that that back and forth was great. But everything else was like just normal for me. And well, at the end, it was good. It's like nice and violent and funny and whatnot. But I just that didn't w- w- win me over as much as it could have. Whatever. Yeah. Right, so um, now we'll finally get into Jaguar Chain, uh, which came out, and you know, un- 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 unlucky us, we did get to see it, you know, Christmas Day, twenty twelve, when it came out in the states. Nah. Yeah, uh, but, but, we, but we saw it earlier. Um, we saw it in twenty sixteen. I believe it was around the time of um of Oscar season. So I think it was like right. around February. I think it was when it came out, right? Okay, um, I, I, that is my memory. I swear, I see that late in the year, though. But not in the, not in the early in the, I can't remember though. The, I'll refresh my memory on that. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, but I will just yeah. I will just say right off the bat though before I get into what the plot is about that this is easily the 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 most crowd pleasing of all of yes. his films. So I I it beat that in a great way. Like, yeah, it is his most accessible. Um, one of his most controversial. Actually, I'll talk about why in a bit. Yeah. Uh, actually, yeah, it's for, for obvious yeah. reasons. Actually, right. But I <laughs> right. yes. Yeah. Right. Uh, so, what is Jago Unchained about? Right. So, no, it's it is inspired by the classic nineteen uh, sixties spaghetti yeah. western, you know, Jago and the spin off movies that came out after after that. Uh, quite personally, right. I'm not a big Jago fan. Like, I'm more nah, into the yeah, yeah, Sergio Leone, you know, the Clint right. Eastwood, the, the Van Cleef kind of stuff. And Jago is just more of a like really dark grim take on on that genre. You know what I mean? Although the, the, the team song what they use in this movie here, you know, still so right. just that Jago team is, is excellent in my opinion, right? Yeah. So very so so very spaghetti western. Right. So uh it centers on a slave. Well, all right, so it's set in eighteen fifty eight, it's in Texas, yep. so technically it's a southern, that's what Tarantino calls it. Not really a western is so it's set in the southern US, right? Um Jago is a slave, uh he's played by Jamie Foxx. Well, Oscar winner Jamie Foxx, actually. And um Funny thing is with Jamie Foxx, uh, this was like right at this lull in his career, basically. So right. after he won the award for Ray, it was like he was just started, you know, shitty movies like Stealth. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and it's just like Tarantino was like, no boy, but like, like, use the margin. And he just cast him. Right. Later. Right. So anyway, so he's a slave. Uh, and one night, you know, he's saved by uh, who he assumes was a dentist, you know, played by, uh, you know, well, once again, Oscar winner Christoph Waltz. But yes. uh, actually, he is a bounty hunter by the name of King Schultz. And what I love yes. about his character, just from a character development perspective, is that, yeah, he was a, he was a dentist at a point in time. Well, but right. is the problem. You know, bounty hunters, you know, business is moving. You know, you make money from, you know, killing a man or bring, delivering a money dead or alive, right? So he does right. switch professions. I love that, right? So, yeah, yeah, so he just makes a living just, well, you know, bounty hunting and stuff like that, right? And he asks uh, Jago about... Um, these three brothers who were working at this plantation that uh, that Jago worked at, and you know, well, responsible for a lot of torture and all that kind of stuff. And that basically is just like, all right, you just need to point these guys out, and I'll go for them. And that's it. You know what I mean? You you get half of my pay, boom, whatever it is, whatever, right? Well, and in this case, it's seventy five dollars. Uh, Jago would have got right, but eventually, right. you know, uh, well, we well. The uh, king and you know the audience sees that you know Jago have a way with guns too. You know I me, mean? he's a he's a really great marksman as well too. It's like hey, yes, this, this kid has something. Him. Okay, cool, cool, cool. So one thing leads to the next, and then well they end up forming this sort of partnership. So they go around basically doing the bounty hunting gig and whatnot. You know, um, and just making people just making money, right? But really, why Jimmy, why Jago sticking around is that uh, he wants uh, King's assistance. To save his wife, right, who is played by um, Kerry Washington, right? She plays yeah. uh, Broomhilda, and she's actually at another estate, right, at, a, at a, another plantation. Um, in this case, it turns out to be this plantation called Candyland, who is which is owned by uh, Calvin J. Candle, who is played by Leonardo DiCaprio. Yeah. In I, what I believe is his first 
villainous rule, you know what I mean? Like it's not right. anti hero like what he was in um uh, in uh Wolf of Wall Street, which he started, you know, the following year. But this right. was his first turn at being like really villainous in a sense, you know what I mean? And right. Just right off the bat, the bad relishes in that though. Like he is a guy that you love to hate, but right? like he has so much yeah. charm, but it's just so you know, so pathological and so messed up at the same time, too. But he just can't help but just smile every time he's on on screen, or, or just where every time he's delivering a line of dialogue, right? So basically, the mission is that uh, Jago and King have to get to that plantation. Well, of course, King, with his you know suaveness and charm, ends up uh, befriending you know uh, Calvin, and they make their way to the plantation. Apparently, well, they're going to like um, buy you know one or two mandigos, mandigo slaves, basically. So right. what they do is just like you know uh, fight in basically, right? Sort of like early wrestling in a sense, right? To the death, of course. And yeah. but basically, it's just the, the mission is just to save Broomhilda, and if it comes to it, hey, King, uh, you know, kill King, and uh, sorry, kill Calvin and whoever else get in the way, right? But I just had to mention one more character before we get to our actual review. You know, we, we have one more character, one other character in the mix, uh, whose name is Steven. Yes. <laughs> who is arguably the biggest Uncle Tom ever right. put to right. screen. Oh, my God. Like, he puts uh, um, Uncle Ruckus from the, Bro- from the right. Boondock series to right. shame, Trent. I, 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 I think if I'm not mistaken, they poked fun at him. I think they poked fun at uh, at um, Samuel Jackson's character in Moondogs yeah. or something like that. I can't remember, yeah. but uh, I'll check. Yeah, and he is, well, uh, he's a house slave, basically, but he's grown right. up with the Cardinal family over the years, and he, of, right off the bat, suspects something wrong with uh, with, with Jago, who is playing just this uh, this uh, assistant, basically, to, 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 uh, to King. Just a guy who could tell, all right, this this slave has these skills. He has the, the, the capability. We'll buy him. You know what I mean? He's of good stock. So, yeah, right off the bat, Stephen knows something's up. And that's all we'll see about um, Jago and Chain. So, uh, what what were your thoughts about the show when you saw it back then? And, and have they changed over the years? Um, I remember really enjoying this movie at the time. I saw this in movie town. I fought it with a, with a bunch of friends. I had a lot of fun with it. Um, what else about, what about this film? Oh, I liked... Okay, so the big thing about this film is that it was going good, going good, going good. And then they did something with, with Dr. King Schultz's character that I really liked. Um, that you learn that he is more emotionally invested in the situation than Jamie Foxx's characters. And I like yes, that character. Yes, yes. That's right. the big um, thing about on, on, this just, just is a video for a bit. This is a team that that shows up in a lot of his films. And I love how they play that in Jago, actually, the idea of playing a character. You know what I mean? So in this case, Jago is playing this, you know, this this free slave, but he's this assistant, right? But he's kind of on a horse for a majority of the scenes involving, uh, well, you know, leading up to, to going to Candyland, right? And he's just, like, looking down at, you know, slaves, which he was at a point in time, right? But, you know, he's yeah. into character. But there's a, there's a moment that I love. I actually forgot that I was in this film. Where, yeah, uh, yeah. where, where King was telling him, dude, be careful though. Like I know you're into character, but kind of dial it back a little bit now. You know what I mean? But right. King is like, no, sorry, Jago is like, well, dude, well, this is how I had to play him, right? You know what I mean? We don't want to sell right. yourself yeah. out, right? So I love that. I love that 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 back and forth with him. But yeah, continue. Yeah, no, yeah, it have, it have a lot of great moments like that. And you see that with the dogs. That's yeah, a great yeah. moment. Great, great moment. Uh, uh, very yeah. shocking. Not yes. too disturbing, but. I love how it comes back, it plays back in especially with uh with, with King's um thought process there in the end, right? Yeah, yeah. And that is why this worked for me so well, is that it it does it does the thing where you 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 realize the situation is not as clear cut and straightforward as it is, in the sense Correct. of oh, this is we could just do this thing and and It'll just be like that. We could just do this this job, and we could just uh, you realize, no, no, you're a lot, you're a lot more invested in this, and you think you are, and you can't just up and walk away from a situation like this as it is. And the it the, then then Jamie Foxx's character now is the exact opposite. He's the character who starts off very very invested and realizes he has to be a lot more stoic and and detached than he than he is to make it work. <clears throat> but that's the way he'll succeed. Right. And I like how they did that from a character perspective, and it works. And then well, you know, it had um. Big Mac music in it, right? So, 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, where is my uh, right? Uh, a hundred black coffins. Oh uh, yeah, black I don't forget yeah. when I heard that for the first time. Right, black, black, black. I need a hundred black coffins. You know what I mean? From Rick Ross, I was like, well, what? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is where we at. All right, all right, Tarantino. First, you know, incorporated yeah. rap now. Yeah. Okay, yeah. would. Yeah. Because at first you're thinking, okay, it's just gonna be you know songs from old you know westerns. Like uh, I remember hearing the team song from uh, Two Mules from Four Sister Sarah, Kids Axe Parents, right? Uh, this right. is the scene where they, they where they ride into the town and all the white people just kind of watch it like, oh my god, is, this a, is that nigga the horse in the weed? That right. that's the song they was playing. Uh, I even heard uh, this song, the only team song from another great uh, spaghetti western called Day of Anger. This is the moment where um, Jimmy is doing the whole training thing with the guns, uh, where he's yeah. shooting at the um, at the snowman. You know, what I, mean? I, I love that that scene by the way. But when I heard that rap, so I was like, "All right, cool." And it got even even <laughs> better when you heard um, when you heard uh, Tupac. You know that get it yeah. over, get it over till yeah. I die. You know, I was like, "Oh, oh, oh, okay." <laughs> yeah, yeah. But go on. Uh, yeah, yeah. The movie had a solid soundtrack as well. Um, as I say. Uh... You know, they, they, um, they had um, stuff, classic songs like um, A Man and His Horse, I think is the name of the song. No, his uh, name is King. His yes. name is King. Yeah, yeah, yeah great song. His name is King, yeah. Great, yeah, classic, great. I always classic. use that, in that, in, that, uh, in that movie, though. Uh, brilliant, in my opinion. This is shot yeah, yeah. to the UP, yeah. sunset, you know, them just... The white shots of them basically riding through the land. You know, I just love yeah, that yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and I can't I can't be um, mad at the Jesse you know when it decide to get ridiculous and gratuitous it works um, for what it is uh, some some great great final shot the final sequence is great and it the, the action is good in this um, yeah. after all, you know yeah I don't really call this necessarily a downside but I kind of get why it in the movie but yeah we got big old big old black nut sack in my face <laughs> yeah yeah uh, yeah I remember. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which, which cracked me up because everybody in the theater was cracking about that shit, eh? but yeah. Um, oh, but I it, was more it, looking at that this situation that Jago was yeah, in, that, him being tied up. Yeah, and, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I, I didn't need to see the, the nuts in my face. Yeah. You know, just, yeah, just, you know? But right. you know, that's that. You know, he just give me a big old black nut sack in my face. Um, yeah. but, and and they bring attention to it too because um, yeah. that only, I think it's Walter uh, Goggins was, was about to cut it off. But then, yeah. But then Samuel Jackson kind of come in and was talking about, well, you know, if, if, if I didn't step in in time, yeah, yeah, we would have we cut that off, right? You know, you know, right. okay, lucky there, right? right. Yeah. Then, then I like I liked the ending with the, you know, this this interesting thing that Tarantino is interesting that somebody like Tarantino will make this part, but uh, this works. The idea of the exceptional, I don't know, I don't know how to feel about it, but, the, you know, they just call it the exceptional man. But, not, but in this case of the story, the exceptional Negro, right? Where you have, you know, there's a classic, there's a classic kind of perennial kind of observation about poor people and black people in the United States or wherever it is, where, where you call crabs in a barrel, right? Right. And they had the character who didn't like him. And then the guy, like, at the end, when he was riding off to go back, when, when after Tarantino's character was blown up. Um, yeah, which, which was hilarious, yeah. by the way. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. cameo in this was so yeah, hilarious. It was, the yeah, Australian bro. accent he had I was like, oh my yeah, god. <laughs> worst actor ever, but whatever. Um, the, that scene where he kind of recognized, oh, yeah, this dude is the real deal, and he kind of appreciated him, and he kind of rooted him at the end. I thought yeah. that was a good moment. It, it was, it was. Um, especially Very, because they, uh, the song that they were playing worked too. It was a, a John Legend song that, that they played there. Uh, I thought that really yeah, worked. Yeah. yeah. And I, um, I, I dug it for what it was. I, I, this movie is, is a strong movie. It's not one of my favorite Tarantinos, but it's, it's still very good. Like, I really enjoy it for what it is. And I just had a lot of fun with this one. Um, I didn't expect it to go the direction it went, especially with some of the characterization. Um, Christoph Waltz really stands out in this. Um, yeah, it's a shame he didn't get nominated. For, uh, I think he got nominated for it, but it but didn't work. Okay, but okay. but right. it won for Best Original Screenplay, which is much... Much easier, right. in my opinion. The writing for this right. is so yeah. excellent. But I'll get to that when I, you know, jump in. But go ahead. Right. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's pretty much me with this. I, I do, um, I, I give this movie a, a very, very high movie tongue, probably low IMAX if it's anything. Um, All right. For what it is, I, I just, I remember having a lot of fun with this one. Um, it, it's, it's, pro- yeah, it does, it does probably Tarantino's funniest movie as well. Um, there's a lot of great comedy in it. Um, good, good set pieces and they build it up as well. 
um, good action. Um, Jamie Foxx held it the entire time as the main character, and it worked. Um, yeah. 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 All right, so I'll, I'll jump in from there just, just to talk about Jamie Foxx. Eh? Uh, I mean, we, we, you know, like going into this, right, for the first time, I knew that Jamie Foxx was going to kill it, though, but yeah, he did. Like, he just yeah. embodied that, that character so well. You know, we just saw his transition, you know, we just the way how he was playing the situation out. He wasn't just the, you know, just the heroic guy 100%. You know what I mean? There was so complexity to his character. You know, this is something that I love with Tarantino films, right? Uh, even right now to, to, to shoot himself, you know what I mean? Him kind of doing his job, but kind of knowing that, you know, if he's not careful, he could lose his life. So I like that early on, you know, when he's put in a corner, he will always kind of put out these bills or, you know, we like, uh, be, sorry, these uh, these warrants, sorry. Uh, basically like, oh, well, please don't kill me. You know what I mean? Yeah, I shot this guy in the middle of the street. But you see, I was I was hired by the government to hunt this guy down. Can you see his original name is this? You know what I mean? So he always has right. that. Uh, so I like that, you know, in the, well, near the end of the, the second act now, where he is put to, put in a corner by both Samuel Jackson and Leo's characters is like, well, there's no way out of this though, but still I had to do something because of what I saw, you know, in that scene that that pretty not disturbing, but just really powerful scene with the dogs that you know and the sleeve. Um but yeah, I mean these 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 characters are so well written. I, I really do love uh, Leo's uh character and performance as well too it's very oscar winning in my opinion you know just yes. like i said he's just a character that you love to hate but like yes he is despicable you know what I mean? especially we how he looks at slaves but the dialogue by the just the the charisma the man has and that's what he does on screen works too uh one scene in particular you know a lot of people go back to it in terms of just his acting range is well the phrenology demonstration right and when he right, slams right. his head on the uh on the top of the um on the skull head and yeah, his heart is bleeding though. Even though when I watch it again, yeah. I saw a cut. So I have a feeling that, you know, behind the scenes, like, you know, Tarantino is like, oh, this is really cool. Let's just keep the blood. But let me actually right. wash the blood off, put some fake blood, and you right. can have it now and, you know, wipe it over Kerry Washington's face when they do your intimidation scene. There. So I don't think that it, they, they kept the, like, he was, I didn't, I didn't think that, you know, he, he was actually bleeding in, you know, that part. You know what I mean? But yeah, when he yeah. slam, he had. That was real. I love that, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Samuel Jackson, no. Oh my God, boy. <laughs> for the moment he man comes on screen, though, and you know, for the makeup, the way how he looks, uh, he looks like a very old, like grizzled version of of Samuel Jackson. But just the way how he talks, like, uh, is that what's that nigga doing on that horse? Let me just see how he talks, just right off the bat, though. Like, you know, when he sees, when he sees Django on that horse, though, it's so incredibly epic in my opinion, because he just cannot believe that happened. I love how, you know, manipulative, how manipulative he is, especially when he pick up on, oh, well, Broomhilda, no, no Django. Wow, you know what I mean? And yeah, just him kind of orchestrating the things, you know, orchestrating the scenes, though. So, it's almost like, yeah, he's actually the villain, the real villain in disguise. It's not just yeah. Calvin, it's actually him though. You know what I mean? I really don't yeah, yeah, yeah. Um I will say though that I wish that there were more that Kerry Washington had more things to do instead of just being this plot device for Jamie right. to to move forward, right? And they do show it right. visually wherever so often he will look, he will glance, he left or whatnot. And you'll see Broomhill just kind of walking or smiling and whatnot. Like, I wish I could have given her more to do than just be the damsel in distress. But I understand right. in the context of the story that, you know, it's... And they, right. they do they do hint yeah. at it early on with, with this German folk story where, yeah, you know, Jago is this knight going for this princess who's locked right. in the tower or whatnot. So that's what it is, you know what I mean? So you can kind of argue, yeah, she get much to do, blah, 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 but... I don't know. Uh, maybe with a maybe a little bit more scenes with her could have worked, but I thought that in the second act you 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 do see a little bit more of her. But I wish that there was a little bit more. That's like one of my gripes. Sir. So the the script itself, you know, which one of Oscar, you know, much easier in my opinion. This is some of Tarantino's best writing in my opinion. It's you know what it probably is most humorous. You know, we there's so much great comedic moments. Like you see with the you know with the cake with the uh with the clansmen. Love that. 
love, love, love that. It's so Monty Python, you know, the way how they'll just stop and just be talking about, you know, what we can't see, you know, we, we can't see through these eyes, you know what I mean? But, and you have that one guy complaining about, oh, he wife spent whole day cutting out those holes and whatnot. It's just so Monty Python, but it works too, especially the payoff, which I actually loved. Um, and yeah, you know, it's just, just comedy, but you get a lot of tension, especially the moments with Calvin. You get, you know, your dramatic moments and whatnot. You get your action scenes. And yes, the action is is incredibly over the top, especially this one shootout that happens in the end of the second act, which I was, you know, is very reminiscent of the Wild Bunch, you know, kids, taxi parents. If you remember that, you know, the climax is arguably one of the most violent scenes ever, ever filmed in a Hollywood movie, yeah, period. Right. You know, we just characters is being gunned down and squibs and blood and bullets, you know what I mean? So in this case, it's just that they, it's like, you know, the squibs just have way more, you know, blood in it. So like every time somebody gets shot, it's like like blood spray though, just squirts of blood coming out. I thought I, I think it actually works so in just this okay. grindhouse exploitation kind of way, you know what I mean? Well, but about one, that it had, part, it had one part in this one that any finale to, to this movie that I, I cracked me up with when he and it looked it just looks so blatant and obvious. Where um she she gets the woman gets shot and she just literally fly off a camera. Yeah. <laughs> I really like, laugh at that. Too. That that right. ended though reminds me a lot of um of Kill Bill Volume One though, you know right. especially all characters get just get wiped out just this quickly there. And even right now to you know Jago saying you know we like when uh Stephen side tries to escape is like wait that's you. You stay right where you are. It was very yeah. much like what Uber Tuber told um. Uh, Oh gosh, the, yeah. the French Gilda in, in Kill Bill Volume One. I actually love right. that sequence, the most, uh, the House of Blue Leaves sequence. Love that, yeah, right? Yeah. But yeah, but the thing that that at first kind of threw me off though, but when I thought about it afterwards, like, but this is some smart writing though, is that yeah. you would think that the climax of the movie was that shootout there, but then no, it just stops, and then you get roughly about 15, 20 more minutes of film, right? And then I was like, but oh gosh, my you, you raised people hopes up so high, you know what I mean? You wanted to see Jago escape. It's like, no, he had to surrender or else, you know, Broomhilda yeah. collect the bullet to the Hedra. You're like, what? What's going on here, man? But really, why why that works is, well, you know, the, the guy that was helping him along, you know, uh, King, who who gets shot, who gets killed, actually. Uh, in, in super slow-mo, by the way, gets shot. He flies back, you know, in, into some books in the library. I really thought that that works. Um, but yeah, because mainly it's just, well, let's just talk about race for a bit. Is the white man basically guiding this black man along? And now, well, the black man has to stand for himself. And I love where in that, well, in the, the, the third act now, where there's a moment where he's talking to these, uh, these slave traders now. One of which is Tarantino in that uh, in that in the, in that uh, guest appearance where you say the, the yeah. actor was terrible, where he's explaining just like how King is. Well, you know, I was going for these these brothers. You know what I mean? And he he's explained it in the same way that King was doing it there. So you know, you could tell yeah. that he's learned a lot from being around King. You know what I mean? I thought that really that that, that was some smart writing there. A great character development too. It shows you know Jago had his own two feet. You know what I mean? Not just having to look around and be like. All right, kick that here. Okay, I gotta kill this guy. Or all right, I got king approval. I gotta kill this guy. So it works, you know, from a character perspective. Uh so now let me talk about the the elephant in the room, though. The Edward, and the amount yeah. of times it was used in the show. So yeah. I, I I remember I remember <laughs> just one second. I remember like it didn't take me out of the show, but I was just amazed at how much times the you know you hear the word nigga in it, but but I right. thought it worked in terms of. You know, just showing just how casual these white people were seeing it and just how bad that word was back then, you know what I mean? And I, I love right. that show really addressed that, right? But, you know what I mean? And it's the point that, you know, even King himself was using it. It's just how casual right. see it in everyday dialogue. And it just really shows the right. hypocrisy of the word, especially with how it's used now. Now, after the fact, though, I was reading up some people hating the film, you know what I mean? Not just because of how gratuitous the violence was to them, but you know, it's a white man using this word in, in a script and putting right. it so much time to show. I remember well what I say, I remember, you know, him well Tarantino you know, get into hot water with that with uh, Jackie Brown in particular, right? Where he used right. that word a lot. Uh well I don't I have to remember if it was a lot in that show, but it in Jaguar Chain it's it's over the it's over a hundred. It's like really a lot of times right. he used that word, right? I remember uh, Spike Lee 
who is notoriously one of Tarantino's detractors, you know, because even from, from Jackie Brown days, you know, yeah, he just didn't like the fact that a hey, white man using nigger in, in a script, what, you know, what I mean? right? So, no, yeah, uh, no problem. He was, one, uh, so he was, he was no. so, last thing, last thing, he was the one I remember him publicly saying, I am not going to see the show. I don't want to see a Western about, you know, slavery and slaves. My people were treated off hell already. I know you have this white man glorifying it in Western form. I am not going to watch that at all. I don't. So, yeah. The thing is, the thing is, okay, the thing is that it's not unprecedented for Tarantino in his filmmaking. So, that's why I didn't have a big issue with it. It's not like, um, it's like Martin Scorsese, no. Martin Scorsese, to me, I think had much more problematic characters than a matter of race. But again, is the world building. That is whether or not you want to accept that or not. That's how I see it. And to me, nothing, more, nothing worse than dead nigger storage, you know, you know in, a, in a dialogue, right? right. But, so that's why I don't have a, a big problem with it in, in, in this. It's like, yeah, it's the time. Yeah, okay, you could have probably toned down on it, maybe. But I don't have an issue with this as much as other people. Like, I don't understand why it was always a problem. Like, how it all of a sudden is a problem. I, don't yeah, get I, I, I think the issue is because of the dialogue and how comedic it could be. So sometimes when you do hear a character say nigga and the way how they say it too, it kind of right. chuckle or you laugh at some point in time. Like, you know, you laugh it, and it kind of no, chuckle no, and then like, oh, okay, I, that's kind of messed up. You know, I get I get it was, for I don't know what was the best word to, to use to describe what was going on there, but it was it was very normalizing, if you want to, for lack of a better term, right? And right. I didn't have, but again, I didn't, I didn't have a big issue. Again, I, I probably it's because I wasn't thinking about it at that time. I had a different, a different political mindset at that time. But I didn't have a big issue with it in that sense, mostly because, one, it's unprecedented. It's not unprecedented for Tarantino. Tarantino was doing this shit a long time. And then two, True. because of the nature of the story, I was like, well, yeah, everybody going to be like casually saying, you wouldn't go right true. Like, yeah. right true. So I didn't see, like, I, I didn't think about it like that. Um, yeah. So I, I found it really strange that people was big in, in uproar over this. Yeah, uh, well, well, mainly that and, and just the fact that, once again, like what Spike Lee said, you're taking something as sensitive, which was the point of the movie anyway, something right. as sensitive as slavery in America and right. making it into this crowd-pleasing Western movie, you know what I mean? Right. 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 I, I don't okay. So I kinda get where Spike coming from, but at the same time is the only Spike, so he just like you know Spike. He's like he's he's over bloatings in, in dumb ways. And, yeah. and you know, say what you want about Spike. I mean I love the man and all that too, but at a point in time, you know I mean look at the portrayals of Italian Americans in his movies, right? Jungle well, Fever did, and do the right thing in particular. Even, yeah, but that's thing I don't not even like making that point. Like that's I'm not even like trying to say, Oh, he's a hypocrite in that way or anything like that. That's not right. the issue. But I just think because it's Tarantino, I, I think it's because I just given Tarantino a pass in that way. Because it's like, yeah, he, he's been doing it in every one of his movies. People didn't make a big up, a big stink about it before. Why make a big stink about it now for this? Because it's a slavery story. Like, all right, if you say so, but not, I didn't see it as a big problem um, for that. And I, yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't like see the, the big thing for this pussy. Like I get, I, I can get it, but not because, but not for Tarantino. Right. If, if it's it. yeah. a point. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Um, but this was a big problem for me though. Neither me, neither me. I was I was into it. I was hooked on the story. It wasn't like, yeah. oh my god, he said nigger again. If he says it one more time, I'm gonna leave. Right, exactly. It wasn't like that. I was hooked on the story, the characters, just the world that you know, his revisionist take basically on history. And that's the word that people have to remember going in. It's like, no, this is not a film glorifying something, you know, glorifying slavery. It's like we're gonna use right. this. We're gonna use a genre that people know and love. I'm gonna just reinvigorate it, right? You know, we right. and yeah, I mean, the man, you know, Tarantino's always loved westerns. You know, you know, and you see it in yeah, practically all of his films. You know, even right down to the Mexican standoff scene in Reservoir Dogs, he loves westerns, right? right. So it was just right. his unique take on it. And the way I see it, uh, like in the '90s, I'll never forget Mario Van Peebles had a movie called Posse, right, which was about black right. cowboys, yeah. right? So yeah, yeah. okay, if a black man did Jaguar and Sheen, and had all the, the dialogue and all that stuff intact. Would there be that much controversy compared to having a white man do it? Think about yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. No, but, it, yeah, the, the, but there's a kind of perpetual argument in Hollywood of, of what connections you have to the kind of movie you want to make and who's going to be the director. And a classic example is Steven Spielberg making thing, right? Um, what do you call it? Uh, co- oh, color, color, color Purple. Yeah, Color Purple. Yeah, color right. purple right? 
color purple, right? It's like that. I mean, anybody going to be like, oh, well, you know, a, a white man make color well, you're, purple. You're a Jew. You don't know about us. You don't know about yeah, our exactly. struggles. Uh, yeah. Right. It's stupidness. And it's like, no, you just have to have a person thing. Like, Tarantino is very... He makes movies that that works for him. And like, okay, yes, he uses... I'll admit, you could probably say he uses the word nigger too gratuitously, but I, I couldn't get into... I don't have a problem with it in the context of this. Like, I get it, but... Uh, I couldn't really yeah. get into it. And, well, yeah, this last thing lasts about just the use of that. It's not like, oh, it's, you know, we like, it's some sort of like gangster slash hip hop thing where, you know, we, you had to use it like every single minute. Like, no, it's not like every single minute a character says that. But it's just, this is how these white people looked at, you know, at black people at any time. Like, it's, right. it's sad, it's shocking, but that's, yeah, that's how it was. You know what I mean? And I find like, you know, and well, one last thing I'll say before I get to read it, you know, just the, the, the spin on it, you know, we this black man going up against, you know, just killing white people there, you know what I mean? Uh, there's even a line where he says, uh, yeah, killing white people for, for money. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like what's not le- what's not to like, you know what I mean? Right. So I know like for some people back then when it came out to me, even to the end or two, they might get taken aback by this, like, oh we glorified black man killing white people. Uh, but hey, he still had the white man guy them true. So Technically, it's both of them, right? So you, you can talk about controversy yeah. from now till that kingdom come, but that's not the point. It's meant to be a crowd pleaser. It's just a right. uh, unique take on, uh, well, I would say a dying genre. You know, it really brought, you know, new life into it. I would say it made fans out of, you know, people who don't even like Westerns. So, you know, the old school heads, and I know old school people who love uh, who love Westerns, right? Like diehard fans loving this movie here. And, you know, just newer yeah. fans who would would not sit down to watch three hours of uh, Good Bad the Ugly, i.e. the second best movie of all time. You know what I mean? But they will enjoy it because it just has so much great moments, so much great dialogue and characters and music. You know what I mean? There's just just a lot of greatness. So for me, this is one of my I would say top five favorite Tarantino films, you know what I mean? Uh, you could argue about, you know, it's not mature enough, you know what I mean, and all that, but still it's just a great director doing what he does and just being unashamed to do it. So for me, Rated wise, I will give this a decent four and a half out of five. I'm going high with this. Uh, this is yeah, one of my yeah. all time favorite uh-huh. uh, Tarantino movies. Uh, 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 last thing I'll say though, I, I kind of doubt we'll ever get this. I, I keep hearing about this Django Zoro, um, you know, spin off movie or something like that because uh, apparently there was a comic book limited series based off of that. So they want to make a movie okay, out of that. Yeah, 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 a crossover okay. comic book. So I like, okay. all right. Nobody Look, cares about Zorro, but hey, nobody cares about Zorro, but hey, I, I would love to see an R-rated Zorro film one day, you know what I mean? Yeah, I would love bring, to see bring, it. Bring back Antonio Banderas, he was hard in, in that Zorro guy, I like his Zorro movie, so. Me too, know. but he too old. <laughs> he too old to play. He, they can he, make him he, up. He, he, he could play, he could play the, the uh, well, the one oh, training, the new Zorro, like what Auntie Hopkins was, he could do that, I love that. I'd bring back Catherine you know, Jones, I love that, but. I don't know. I, I, to me, you can just make him our old zoo. That's all you do with it. And you, you, you write a story around, in and around that. I don't know. We'll see. Whatever. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. But yeah, if you haven't seen Jaguar Chain, uh, why, why haven't you? you? You need to. It is one of the... It is arguably the most enjoyable Tarantino movie. It's one of his best works. If you're a fan, you probably saw this already. But if you're not, yeah, give this a look, man. You, you will enjoy it. It's a way, shape, or form. So check it out, man. All right.